All right, Madison, go ahead and start the recording, please. Okay, the recording is now started. Welcome and thank you for standing by. During today's conference, all lines will be open and interactive. We ask that you use your mute button when you are not speaking, or you may press star six to mute and unmute your line. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Brian. Thank you, you may begin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Here we go, this is the exciting time. My name is Brian Jackson, Victor Echo Six. Juliet Bravo Juliet in Airdrie, Alberta, Canada. I'll be your amateur radio moderator for today's contact. Through the help of amateur radio volunteers and the crew on the International Space Station, we hope to soon establish ham radio contact with the ISS as it flies more than 350 kilometers above the Earth towards Belgium. This is all accomplished with ARIS, amateur radio on the International Space Station. The ISS currently is flying over the Atlantic Ocean and is on a southwest and northeast heading, whizzing along at around 28,000 kilometers an hour. This contact will be performed using the Amateur Radio Telebridge Network, a worldwide network of amateur radio ground stations that enable students to contact the ISS. What makes today's contact unique is the fact that all participants Students and students are safely situated in their homes to avoid personal contact in line with COVID-19 protocols. The exception is Jan and his team at the ground station in Belgium who are all following safety protocols. We call this a multi-point contact and they've only been done a few times in recent months. Thanks to you all for joining us today and staying safe during today's event. ARIS is a consortium of ham radio volunteers from nine nations that develop and operate the amateur radio station on the International Space Station. Some members of ARIS are the American Radio Relay League, the Worldwide AMSAT Radio Amateur Satellite Corporations, the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and the Russian Federal Space Agency. The amateur radio ground station that will establish contact with the ISS is Oscar November 4, India Sierra Sierra, ON4 ISS in Antwerp, Belgium, operated by Jan Papouillet, ON7UX. Thanks for all of your work in making this happen for us today, Jan. A special thanks to mentor Steve McFarlane, Victor Echo 3, Tierra Tango Bravo Delta, in, and for his hours of work to develop this contact today. We have about four minutes until contact time. Our contact today is with Chris Cassidy, KF5 KDR, who will be operating OR4 ISS on board the International Space Station. Chris will be talking with students at the American School in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. This event will also be broadcast around the world via the internet through the ARIS YouTube channel. Many thanks to John and Steve in the USA for making for their work to make this broadcast possible. We'll now ask Kenneth Horrocks to briefly tell us about the American School in Rio and the students taking part today. Go ahead, Kenneth. Welcome to the American School of Rio de Janeiro, home of the ERRJ Panthers. From our humble beginnings in 1937 in a small house in Ipanema, to our two amazing world-class campuses today, we have been proud to help generations of young people find their own unique path. Today, we are privileged to be able to offer a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, a chance to talk to astronauts in space. Thanks, Kenneth. Thank you, Brian. John, before the contact begins, John, please tell us a little about ON4ISS, your ham radio station, where you are and how you'd like to handle the conversation today. Yes, okay, thank you. The amateur radio station that assists you today uh, is uh, located in Belgium, situated in the southern region near Antwerp, and the town where I live is Artelaar. This amateur radio ground station is kept operational by the UBA section AAA, the Antwerp Active Amateurs. And in the realization of this Aris Telebridge radio station, our six volunteers direct involved. We use two-way radios, a fully computer-controlled frequency control, and uh, also antenna tracking, both in elevation as in azimuth, is also computer-controlled. So uh, my antennas are already pointed in the direction of uh, 252 degrees 
uh, west. That's the direction where we're expecting uh, contact the ISS. Uh, when I start calling, uh, I will uh, listen to the response. And when I heard nothing, uh, we heard this noise. Uh, So that's in short what uh, the station uh, will do, uh, Brian. Excellent. Thanks, Jan. Remember that what we're doing today is an, on the International Space Station is truly an experiment. We can never tell the results, either positive or negative, until that experiment is over. Students, please don't forget to say the word over as we've talked about before. In about 30 seconds, the station should be coming up over Belgium. So, Jan, I'm going to turn it all, all over to you. Good luck and enjoy the contact, everybody. Okay, thank you, Brian. Well, uh, station is now uh, 2,425 miles uh, kilometers uh, in uh, direction, and it starts uh, popping up over the horizon. So I uh, begin calling, and it can happen that we have to call them two or thri uh, three times before you can answer. It's Oscar Romeo for ISS. Oscar Romeo 4 ISS. This is Oscar November 4, India Sierra Sierra for an air scale contact. I'll copy over. Oscar November 4, India Sierra Sierra. Hello, this is Oscar Romeo 4, India Sierra Sierra. I hear you loud and clear. Over. Okay, Chris, uh, thank you for replying my call. Uh, we have uh, students in uh, Rio de Janeiro here, and I will inform you that the We'll do a short greeting before they asking their first questions. Uh, the question will follow automatically. Are you ready for that, Chris? Over. I'm ready for this. Over. Thank you. Okay, school. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, November Alpha 1 ISS. Christopher Cassidy. Thank you very much. I'm in the moot point contact. My name is Tony, Papa Yankee 1 Alpha X-ray. I'd like to say to you thank you very much for this opportunity for students in the name of the HAM Amateur Radio Community in Rio de Janeiro, by Labre, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Take a good advantage for this opportunity, students. Go ahead, Kenny. Welcome to the American School of Rio de Janeiro, home of the EARJ Pampas, where we help young people find their own unique path. Today, we are so privileged to be able to offer this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity a chance to talk to astronauts in space. Go ahead, Pedro. Pedro, has the coronavirus pandemic affected the safety protocols aboard the ISS in any way, or is it? Hi, Pedro. Thanks for your question. Before I answer Pedro's question, I'd like to say it's a real treat to talk to the American School of Brazil. I was there personally in November of 2016, uh, and I, very, I remember very fondly visiting the school and the campus and having lunch in the cafeteria. Uh, and talking to the, to the students in, at the gym, in the gymnasium. So uh, thank you very much for calling me today. Pedro, the coronavirus has, has definitely affected how we uh, uh, astronauts prepare for space. We have to maintain a safe, safe uh, distance with protection with the masks. And, uh, and in, the months, in the two months before launch, crew members go into quarantine or more, more strict re, re, uh, uh, protocols. And the last uh, three weeks is very strict quarantine. Over. Lorena, how do you exercise in space so you keep your muscles and bones active? Over. Hi, Lorena. So we have uh, three different exercise devices, a treadmill, a bicycle, and a weightlifting machine. The weightlifting machine is actually uh, air resistance in a, in a, a vac vacuum cylinder that we can adjust the piston up and down and provide the resistance and we can uh, move the, the bar to accommodate leg exercises or upper body exercises and that's how we keep our bones nice and strong. It's, it's nice that we get uh, our muscles toned but really it's our bone health that we care a great deal about uh, from this exercise. Over. On behalf of George, has your goal always been getting into space since you were a child, or did you have different interests when you were a child? Over. So, George, thanks for the question. When I was a child, I, I liked sports a great deal, and I, I was uh, in, had visions of playing sports or being a coach 
or being a referee in some kind of uh, sporting event. I liked basketball a great deal. But as I grew older, I became more interested in, in uh, math and science, and, uh, and then ultimately an engineering degree in graduate school. And as I was learning all these um, academic things, I realized that being an astronaut is something that anybody can apply to do and, and fill out the, the, the packet to become one. So that's what motivated me as I, as I grew, grew more interest in science and, and technology over. On behalf of Kyle, do you support a football team? And if so, how do you follow them from space? Over. Well, we we um, we do follow the news and we follow sports. And we we can uh, occasionally get on the internet, but we have a news daily news and daily sports broadcasts uh, recorded and sent up to us. So this is how we follow along, especially when there's big big sporting events going on. Although this particular uh, time and space for me, it's marked by the coronavirus pandemic, and so there's not much sports going on in the world. My favorite fo American football team are the New England Patriots, and uh, I, I, I haven't quite got a soccer uh, favorite team quite yet. Oh. What are some of the most memorable moments you've had since becoming an astronaut? Over. Like this, nice question. So, since becoming an astronaut, the, the first memorable moment was the, the moment I received a phone call to tell me that I was chosen to become an astronaut. That was an amazing and a life-changing phone call. The second moment uh, that I really sticks with me is when I was called by the, the chief astronaut to tell me that I was going to be on uh, my first mission. And that was a, big, a year and a half of training to launch on the space shuttle. And my third amazing moment was the moment that I first saw outside the hatch on my very first spacewalk. Over. Elena, since the date we visited the moon in 1969, we have made multiple trips to space in which we had learned a lot about it. What would you consider would be the next step for humans in space exploration? Over. It's an easy one for us because we very much know our goals. Our goal is to get uh, humans on Mars. Uh, we will very likely take a, a intermediate step and return people to the moon sometime in the next uh, handful of years. Uh, as we sort that out, but by the time you are an astronaut, Elena, I think we will have people going to Mars. Over. On behalf of Santiago, how does sound differ in space from on Earth? Are there any big differences in what you hear, or is it the same? Over. Santiago, inside the space station, it, it sounds a lot uh, the same as what you're used to. We have a lot of background noises, fans, machinery noises, and pumps, uh, so it's a little bit noisy inside the space station. Outside the space station, it's a vacuum of, of space, and the sound does not propagate through the vacuum, so there's really nothing to hear uh, out, out there. Uh, over. Leonardo. What was the worst accident that happened in the International Space Station, and how was it dealt with? Over. On the International Space Station, we've been very fortunate that we haven't had too many serious accidents, although one that I'm very familiar with was during a spacewalk seven years ago. I was with uh, an Italian astronaut named Luca Parmitano when his spacesuit malfunctioned and water was flowing into his helmet and filling up the inside volume of his helmet. Uh, we had to hurry up and get back in to get his helmet off. Over. Michele, what is it like to reach escape velocity? Were you scared that your, that your spacecraft would explode during takeoff? If so, how did you handle this fear? Over. When we get on the launch pad, it, we understand that there's a, a giant uh, chemical reaction that's about to happen underneath us and launch us to space. You feel you don't feel the velocity, you feel the acceleration. So it's during this eight and a half minutes where the rocket is, is accelerating you and pushing you faster and faster that you, you feel pushed to the back of your seat. Do, are we scared? I wouldn't say we're scared because we, we have a great deal of training and preparation and we know that there's backup systems for different all the types of failures that we can think of at least. So uh, 
We have a healthy appreciation for what's happening on the launch day. Over. Madeline, after being in the gravity for so long in space, what is it like to return to gravity? Over. Madeline, when we get back to Earth after being gone for all this time, uh, it, our bodies have definitely have to get used to it. It takes several days to feel semi-normal, and it takes several weeks, probably like a month, to feel completely normal. In those first couple of days, we're not allowed to drive a car. We uh, are very wobbly and, uh, and, and need assistance with things like simple things like going down stairs um, or jumping across a sidewalk, off a sidewalk onto a street. But those things come back very quick, pretty much after several days. Over. Olivia, how long does the training take to become an astronaut on the ISS? Over. Hi, Olivia. We train before, when we first get selected, when we have to learn all of the basic activities, this part takes maybe uh, officially two years, but usually it takes folks about five years maybe or so before, five to six years before they fly their first mission, and that depends just case by case. Uh, once you get assigned to a particular mission, it's generally another two years of training with your crewmates before you're ready to launch and come to the space station. Over. Theater, does the absence of gravity make it harder to eat and drink certain foods in space? Over. The absence of gravity uh, makes, it doesn't affect how it feels to eat, but certain foods are more difficult, particularly ones that are dry, like rice, potato chips, um, things that don't stick together are sometimes challenging, challenging to eat. Things that are wet where the surface tension of the, of the food keeps it together, it's uh, very convenient to eat this food. Over. Okay, Chris, thank you. Uh, we uh, are having a lot of signals, so thank you for your uh, good answer, making time for uh, talking to uh, students in uh, Rio de Janeiro. We are happy that this is a sexual contact uh, Thank you, 7-3. This is Oscar November 4, India Sierra Sierra in Oven Clear with Oscar Romeo 4 ISS. 7-3. And with that, they have disappeared over the horizon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've just shared a moment in history. Amateur radio station ON4 ISS in Antwerp, Belgium operated by Jan Papoyer, ON7UX, contacted astronaut Chris Cassidy, KF5KDR, aboard the International Space Station, speaking with students at the American School in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Congratulations to all students involved. Uh, give yourself a pat on the back. Fantastic. I'm glad that we were able to get through 12 questions. Apologies to those that we could not get to today. Now for the international volunteer team of ARIS, including the radio amateur satellite corporations around the world, ARRL, TSA, ESA, JAXA, NASA, and Roscosmos. This is Brian Jackson, VE6JBJ, sending my greetings to all of you in amateur radio terms. 7-3 from me in Airdrie, Alberta, Canada. Madison, would you mind stopping the recording?